Good morning and welcome to episode 69 of our Case of the Week series published in partnership with ASEDS. My name is Kelly Twigger. I am the CEO and founder of eDiscovery Assistance as well as the principal at ESI Attorneys. And I am very happy to be here with you today. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, as you know, each week we choose a recent decision from our eDiscovery Assistant case law database and highlight uh, key issues for what that means for you, your clients, your practice, and how to use uh, those thoughts strategically. Um, as always, you can find the link to the decision that we're discussing today <clears throat> in uh, either in the post or in the comment section, depending on which platform you're viewing us on, uh, whether that's YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. Um, you'll also find today a link to an article from eDiscovery Today written by our good friend uh, Doug Austin, also about this decision. <clears throat> All right, let's get into today's case. Today's case is actually going to be a pretty quick one, but it has some great uh, takeaways from it as far as proportionality is concerned. Our decision comes to us from the uh, class action securities fraud case titled Edwards versus McDermott International, Inc., um, today's decision is from May 18th, 2022, uh, written by United States Magistrate Judge Andrew Edison. Um, Judge Edison has eight other decisions included in the eDiscovery Assistant database. He's written thoughtfully on some um, key eDiscovery issues, so it's worth taking a look at those if you're in front of Judge Edison. Um, issues for today's case, as you know, we always tag our um, case law and content in the eDiscovery Assistant database using our proprietary issue tagging structure. And those issues today include search terms, um, proportionality, <clears throat> and inaccessibility. All right, let's dive into what the facts of our case are. As I mentioned, the underlying dispute here involves a securities class action fraud case. Um, before the court is a discovery dispute uh, regarding the scope of the documents to be reviewed and produced. In November of 2021, uh, the plaintiffs here identified 50 custodians from whom they wanted to collect documents, and they also proposed search terms to the other side. The parties then spent about five months going back and forth, exchanging proposals on search terms uh, to try to come to some agreement on what should be uh, collected and reviewed. At this point before the court, the parties are really at an impasse. Um, the plaintiffs have identified uh, search terms that provide for a total of 1.3 million documents to be reviewed, including families, and the defendants um, have countered with a search term proposal that would identify just less than half of that or about 650,000 documents. So huge difference in terms of the number of documents that we're talking about identifying for review and production. There does not appear from this decision to be any additional evidence before the court that the defendants have provided of sampling um, any of the information, providing feedback, hit reports, um, relevance as to particular hits on search terms. None of that seems to be before the court on this motion. <clears throat> At this point, the defendants claim that the costs of plaintiff's proposal on the 1.3 million documents are too expensive and the court is undertaking an analysis as to how it should allow the parties to proceed. So in terms of that analysis, the court starts with Rule 26B1 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. Um, and I'm going to just highlight for you this particular language, which we see in almost every um, e-discovery decision, um, but it's usually more on the relevant side than it is on the proportionality side. So this is the key quote from Rule 26B1. Unless otherwise limited by court order, the scope of discovery is as follows. Parties may obtain discovery regarding any non-privileged matter that is relevant to the party's claim or defense and proportional to the needs of the case, considering the importance of the issues at stake in the action, the amount in controversy, the party's relative access to relevant information, the party's resources, the importance of the discovery in resolving the issues, and whether the burden or expense of the proposed discovery outweighs its likely benefit. Information within this scope of discovery need not be admissible in evidence to be discoverable. Okay, so that's close quote. That section requires two things, relevance and proportionality. And the court really dives into here the definition of proportionality, um, which focuses on the marginal utility of the discovery sought. 
And as you can tell from what I just listed for you in that quote, there are six, fig, six factors um, that determine proportionality under Rule 26B1. The importance of the issues at stake in the action, the amount in controversy, the party's relative access to relevant information, the party's resources, the importance of discovery in resolving the issues, and whether the burden or expense of the proposed discovery outweighs its likely benefit. If a party resists discovery on the bound grounds of proportionality, that party bears the burden of making a specific objection and showing that the discovery fails uh, Rule 26B's proportionality calculation. So essentially here, it is on the defendants to show that the discovery that the plaintiffs are requesting that results in 1.3 million documents for review is not proportional uh, to the needs of the case. And so in order to be able to assess that proportionality, the court looks individually at each of the six factors and takes really large picture view of the case because that's really the only evidence before the court. There's nothing specific for the court to base on uh, these specific six factors under Rule 26. So starting with the importance of the issues at stake, um, the court really finds that given the central purpose of the security laws is to protect investors and would-be investors against uh, misrepresentations like those alleged in this case, there's not really um, any debate that the issues in the, at stake in the case are meaningful. That factor weighs in favor of the plaintiffs. The second factor is the amount in controversy. <clears throat> and the court notes that the large amount that the plaintiffs are seeking to recover here, which is more than a billion dollars in damages, um, weighs very heavily in favor of allowing the sought after discovery that plaintiffs have asked for. So that factor weighs in favor of the plaintiffs. The third factor is the party's relative access to relevant information. And with regard to this uh, particular factor, the court looks at the fact that the requested documents really consist of emails and other electronic communications that are all maintained by the defendants. And the defendants have complete and exclusive control over their electronic platforms. Um, and there is no additional way for the plaintiffs to obtain such information other than from the defendants through the discovery process. As a result, the court finds that that factor weighs in favor of the plaintiffs um, and providing all of the discovery that the plaintiffs are seeking. Uh, the fourth element is the party's resources. And the court notes that they really don't have, it really does not have much to go on here. And those are the court's exact words. The court says, I know that McDermott has been through a bankruptcy proceeding and plaintiff's main source of recovery is expected to be through an insurance agreement but I am unaware of the specific policy limits and neither side has offered any argument or evidence on this factor. As a result, I view this factor as neutral, close quote. So this one stays uh, really neutral, not for either side. So we've essentially got three factors in favor of the plaintiffs and the fourth one is neutral. Um, the fifth factor is the importance of the discovery in resolving the issues. And for this one, I'm gonna read you exactly what the court says because it's the most crucial. Plaintiff's search terms appear, for the most part, to be tailored to obtaining documents that are relevant to the claims and defenses in this case. As I have noted before, I am well aware of the costs associated with email pulls. I am also mindful of how important email searches can be to unlocking the truth in certain securities fraud cases. Nobody, of course, knows what the email searches will reveal until the documents are reviewed and non-privileged relevant documents are produced but it is awfully likely that the sought after documentation is relevant and highly probative of plaintiff's claims and defendant's defenses in the case, close quote. Based on that, the court found that the importance of discovery in resolving the issues leans towards the plaintiffs. So we've got five out of, uh, five out of six, four out of five factors so far leaning in favor of the plaintiffs. The final factor is whether the burden or expense of the proposed discovery outweighs its likely benefit. And here is where the parties really fall short in providing evidence to the court. And by parties, I really mean the defendants because they're the ones with the burden to show that the discovery sought is not proportional to the needs of the case. And here the court really says that it can't say because um, whether or not the plaintiff's requested search terms will provide more information than defendants proposed search terms. The court goes on to state that one would expect that the additional search hits will yield more information, but where do you draw the line? Uh, the court notes that the whole purpose of the proportionality requirement is to set boundaries on the amount of documentation plaintiffs can obtain through the discovery process. 
and it acknowledges that discovery in securities fraud cases is very costly. So in order to protect the defendants in securities fraud cases from the burden and expense of premature discovery, the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995 precludes discovery until the district court sustains the sufficiency of the complaint. And so the court then addresses the fact that um, the that Judge Hanks has denied the defendant's motion to dismiss brought under those sections. And as a result, that the defendants are fully entitled to employ the discovery devices provided by the civil, the federal rules of civil procedure. That discovery door has been open, quote, flung wide open, close quote, and plaintiffs should be allowed to probe inside, according to the court. The purported damages in this case are huge, and that indicated to the court that the plaintiff's proposal was proportional to the needs of the case. The court notes that it's a close call, but ultimately concludes that the scales tip in favor of the plaintiffs on the proportionality analysis. As such, um, noting that five of the six factors weighed in favor of the plaintiffs, the court orders the defendants to prom uh, promptly apply plaintiff's proposed search terms, review the responsive documents expeditiously for privilege and relevance, and produce relevant non-privileged documents on a rolling basis. So that's really the breakdown of the analysis, the proportionality factors. And what I'd like to highlight is the fact that, you know, when arguing to the court on a motion for proportionality, you're going to need to have specifics to be able to argue that sixth factor, which is, is the cost of providing the information really relative to um, the needs of the case? And here, in order to be able to make that argument effectively, what the defendants needed to do was provide some sampling of search terms or hit reports or specifically review some samples of documents and be able to show to the court why specific search terms are going to be overbroad. Um, in cases that we've seen here on Case of the Week and other case law in the eDiscovery System database, the proportionality considerations come down to you showing the court specifically and factually based on search terms, why search terms are overbroad and not going to be proportional to the needs of the case. And I think that's our biggest takeaway from today's case is that you've got to be able to show more evidence, particularly in a large scale class action worth billions of dollars, where it seems that the plaintiffs have worked diligently to provide uh, search terms that didn't seem um, overbroad to the court in this particular instance. Um, nothing in the opinion about the analysis provided by the defendants as to the documents um, really gave the court any teeth to be able to, to chomp into, to be able to say, you know, there's no real need for this broad scope of discovery. We've seen in other proportionality cases where the court has ordered that the parties start with a certain level of information um, based on search terms and expand out or that the parties agree on a certain set of sample search terms for custodians and then branch out based on uh, rulings from the court or coming back to the court with more specific information about what additional information is needed. But here the parties just didn't do that. Um, the defendants didn't put anything before the court that we can see in this decision. There may be, as always, more information in the briefing than is available on this decision, but that's not what we look at for purposes of our case of the week. All right. That's our case of the week for this week. Thank you so much for joining me. We'll be back again next week with another decision from our eDiscovery Assistant database. If you are an ASEDS member and interested in using eDiscovery Assistant, there is a discount available to current ASEDS members, as well as a trial for folks who are taking the ASEDS exam. If you're interested in either of those, there's information available to you in your ASEDS portal about how to contact us. If you're interested in doing a free trial of our um, case law database and resource tool at eDiscovery Assistant, you can log on to eDiscoveryAssistant.com and click in the upper right hand corner on free trial or reach out to us at support at eDiscoveryAssistant.com to set up a demo for you and your team. Thanks so much. Stay safe and healthy out there and I'll see you next week.